द लॉ ऑफ कर्मा अघोरा थ्री बाय रॉबर्ट स्वबोधा चैप्टर सेवन रिपे इज बीइंग कंटिन्यूड आई वंस ट्रीटेड ए वुमेन अ वुमेन हु हैड बीन सीक्रेटली गिवन भला टका नो ऑर्डिनरी रेमेडी कुड गिव हर एनी रिलीफ बिकॉज नो वन हैड सस्पेक्टेड द ट्रूथ शी सफर्ड फॉर फुल टू फुल ईयर्स फ्रॉम दिस पॉइजन बिफोर शी केम टू मी एंड गॉट द स्पेसिफिक एंटीडोट बजरंगी वॉज ए रियल प्री ऑक्यूपेशन ड्यूरिंग मच ऑफ नाइनटीन सेवेंटी नाइन एंड बाई द स्प्रिंग ऑफ नाइनटीन एटी वी वर रेडी टू थ्रो इन द टॉल ऑन हिम वेन द इंटरप्राइजिंग डॉक्टर मारतांडा हैपेंड टू ड्राइव अस टू द स्टेबल्स वन आफ्टरनून वी एस्कॉर्टेड द डॉक्टर फ्रॉम स्टॉल टू स्टॉल इंट्रोड्यूसिंग हिम टू विमलानंदाज फोर लेग्ड चिल्ड्रन until we reached bajrangi where we recounted our vows in full what said the doctor such a minor thing and no one has been able to deal with it it is obvious that he lacks marrow in the bones of his back since the marrow tissue is the foundation of shukra he must have a deficiency of sperm which has kept his vitality low great i thought Ripe could not get enough of his own sperm and Bajrangi does not have enough to go around. I can cure him, said Dr. Martanda, with just two doses of medicine. All you have to do after a dose him is to feed him the soup made from one dozen goat thigh bones and I guarantee you a cure. Dr. Sahib said Vimalananda smoothly, horses have no gallbladders. and feeding him something as fatty as marrow soup will give him colic that will kill him do not worry yourself in the least replied the ever theoretical dr martanda i guarantee that no harm will come to him vimalananda and i looked at one another until at last he said to me what do we have to lose though tehmul was not pleased with this proposal at all he agreed to permit the doctor try his portion for he realized that if anything untold did happen we would at least be able to collect on bajrangi's insurance money the groom was therefore ordered to proceed to the market and buy the appropriate bones the next morning dr martanda arrived at the staples promptly after the morning work to administer the first dose tehmul standing by expecting calamity at any moment but bajrangi showed complications neither that day nor the next and the next jockey to mount him testified that the horse was no longer doing her previous dance the goat marrow had presumably filled his bones for his track would work improved weekly the day that he actually ran ran a race was one of the highlights of our season vimalan and the laid no wager on his horse who had let us down so often in the past but we were just happy to see him out competing with his fellows on the grass after running once or twice more bajrangi still showed no signs of wanting to win so we disposed of him after the fact vimalananda questioned the wisdom of his decision to make to name out netu name our sperm deficient horse bajrangi which in the which is the hindi version of one of the sanskrit names of anjaneya he had hoped in vain that carrying such a name would make him want to live up to standards of his namesake and run well now vimalananda speculated that the opposite might have been the case it is always good to name your child after god that is how ajamila was saved do you recall when death came for him he called for his son narayana but got through to lord vishnu narayana himself i had no intention of commercializing anjaneya's name when i named my horse bajrangi but it is possible that it might have seemed that way to the law of karma since he was racing for money this might in fact have been one of the factors that prevented his progress it is so difficult to know the law of karma in detail and impossible to know in its entirety completely impossible even for the rishis it did not seem like a bad idea to me at the time because 
Anjaneya has helped me advance my career in the past. During my salad days as a pro wrestler, it was the power of Anjaneya that sustained me. Could I have ever done it on my own? Ha! Anjaneya, who has from his birth been the patron deity of wrestlers, continued to sustain Vimalananda even in my era when he would challenge to arm wrestling the young Maharashtrian wrestlers who used to come to him to get his blessings for an upcoming boat. Invariably, the heart patient in his mid-sixties would easily defeat the youthful muscle man and when they would shamefacedly admit defeat, he would tell them, Don't worry, my boy, which Hanuman can withstand the power of which human can withstand the power of Anjaneya. Remember this and when you return to your village, do not forget to pay your respects to the temple of Anjaneya there, a temple whose new image had been purchased by that very doctor Martanda who had treated Anjaneya's equine namesake. <clears throat> the Ayurveda internship program at the Tarachand Ramnath Charitable Ayurvedic Hospital depleted my 1980s spring and summer aside from the odd weekend in bombay i could meet vimalananda only when he came to pune to pay a visit to his four-legged friends a few of my instructors made regular pilgrimages to his hotel during his stays hoping to mop up for their own practices the old the odd treatment tip that vimalananda would occasionally spill they were intrigued with his knowledge of herbs and minerals and with his ability to diagnose people by taking his own pulse. He was intrigued with the possibility that he might somehow get some of them to think originally for his change. Aside from Dr. Vasant Lard, though few of these physicians impressed him, Vimalananda, who appreciated Dr. Lard's devotion to his guru Hambir Baba, and his personal deity Ganesha, the elephant-headed remover of obstacles, assisted him and his family in various ways. The favoritism made some of the other faculty members who regarded Dr. Lard's station in life as being beneath theirs determined to take from Vimalananda the assistance that they felt they deserved. As these men had no deep interest in Ayurveda, Jyotish, Tantra or any other form of classical Indian wisdom, Vimalananda protected himself creatively from them. For example, after Dr. Paduke brought his father to Vimalananda one day to ask his help in reversing a chronic intestinal infirmity, Vimalananda said, Oh, it can be fixed all right. I can guarantee it. But if it is he, but if it is he will lose all his money. Which will it be? Health without wealth or wealth without health? After they left, Vimalananda confidently predicted that he would never see them again and he never did. The crannies of the bulk of these doctors disappointed Vimalananda acutely. He expected that anyone who had been blessed with the opportunity to imbibe Sanskritic learning ought to evince the same broad mind, broadness of mind quickness of wit and keenness of awareness that seemed to come effortlessly to him. A lack of art, grace and culture in otherwise knowledgeable men and women always seemed to disgruntle him. In 1980, he responded to the only invitation he ever received from my college with an address to its staff that went something like this. It is no surprise that no one wants to learn Ayurveda nowadays, since no one is uh, teaching the real meat of Ayurveda. If you really want your students to understand Ayurveda, you must teach them that they are only that there are only four things in medicine: dukkha, dukkha ka karana, karana ka upay, or upay ka ant. That is misery, the cause of misery, the remedy for the cause, and the end of the remedy. As Ayurvedic physicians, we want to liberate our patients mostly from physical sorrow. This means that we must be fully conversant with the structures in which diseases develop, the dhatus, tissues and malas, wastes. Teach your students why diagnosis of disease is usually by mala. By mala. 
the wastes are produced during the metabolic process which produce the tissues which means that if you know the malas you will know the dhatus unfortunately you people overlook many of the malas malas means the waste products that come out of the body like dandruff even examination of dandruff can yield significant information in particular about the bones given that head hair is an upadhatu secondary tissue of bone in a way the bones are a bridge between the astral body which is the mind and the physical body bone is governed by vayu the air element which also appears in the body as prana what controls prana controls the mind and vice versa also as a tissue bone is the foundation of marrow which is the foundation of shukra which is the foundation of ojas which is the foundation of health health no dandruff in detail and you can know the patient's health if you want good health you must nourish your tissues well which means you must nourish the tastes in your body when you lack tastes your metabolism is affected even if you lay a big meal before a sick man he will not be interested his taste is not there lack of taste within the body causes a patient of jaundice to lack appetite disturbance of the inner taste process causes the appetite to be lost in fever ayurveda is the only medicinal system which describes medicines for supplying to the body the tastes which it lacks teach your students that actually all the tastes are inside but we look for them outside in our food our job as physicians is to create the proper taste within a sick person so that proper tissue nourishment will resume and natural immunity in the form of ojas will increase this is why we use medicines not just to suppress disease like the allopaths do but to return the patient's balance to normal you you are great ayurvedic uh, author charaka learned about medicinal herbs by watching what animals ate when they were sick students should learn in the same way you should teach them how to make the plant talk to you how to make it tell you these are my qualities my tastes and my useful parts and i am useful in this disease those who really know ayurveda know that each plant has a thousand uses teach your students why we like to use plants for our medicines plants and animals complement one another nicely plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen while animals exhale carbon dioxide and inhale oxygen teach them all the details of how to collect medicinal plants when you inform them that plants should never be collected at night tell them the reason why plants breathe at night if you collect them then it is like strangling them if you strangle the plant do you think it will be interested in trying to help you help your patient teach your pupils how one plant antidotes another teach them the secret use of apmarga tulsi and bilva plants which can make you clear 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 audient and clairvoyant teach them the limitations of herbs and why we also use medicines from made from minerals above all teach them the real meaning of rasayana rejuvenation literally the path of rasa because it is only through rasa taste juice emotion that rejuvenation can occur all the assembled physicians nodded sagaciously and thanked him for his comments but when we were alone again vimalananda shook his head with resignation and said is it any wonder that ayurveda is in such a desperate state today your professor seem to be good people by and large but most of them simply do not know ayurveda so how do they think that they are going to teach it they do not even know the simplest things about ayurveda which as how to develop your body what is the use in knowing about ayurveda if you can't even develop your body a wrestler was talking i asked what method do you like best for your body development he replied it depends on the individual bhang works well for many people wrestlers who live in banaras have made a science of how to use a bhang as part of their training regimen after their morning workout they will bathe in the ganga get a 2 hour massage bathe again eat well and take a nap on arising they will defecate to lighten their bodies and minds 
then bath again, then get at another massage, then take bhang. They eat when the intoxication of the bhang is at its height. Try it, your body will develop amazingly. We do not expect though that using bhang like this is going to help them free kundalini from its constraints. Bhang, this is a kind of intoxicant. It's found in India. How could it in fact, it will make ahankara identify even more firmly with the body. But you have to decide what you want to do with your life. Only then can Ayurveda help you. If you want to go the way of awakening Kundalini using a bhang, then you have to use it in another way, which I am sure that your professors are also unaware of. Do they have any idea of real way to perform rejuvenation? Do they know that while herbs can make you live 400 to 500 years, you can go on almost indefinitely if you know how to use mercury? Do they know that you can extract copper from peacock feathers and mercury from bilva leaves or that alchemical gold shows different results from mined gold when seen in the mass spectrometer? They teach chemistry at your college. But do they know anything at all of the real Rasa Shastra alchemy? Have they ever heard of, much less seen the many ways to solidify mercury or the few ways in which you can make mercury agnistai fire fast so that it will not melt when placed into a fire? The true alchemy, my boy, is not even easy to understand, much less do. I wonder how many of your instructors are even interested in understanding it. One way in which I am different from most doctors is that most doctors, not all but most, see sick people as money-making projects. I look at them with Smashantara's eyes instead and see them as my own children. When I can help someone's escape, someone escape from a disease, I feel as if I have helped cure my own daughter or son. I love to do that but I do not want anyone to know how I am doing it. Why should they know? If they are sick, they should be interested in the result, not in the process. And if they are doctors, I do not want them to know how I do things. If they learn, they will just go out and commercialize my knowledge. They will use it to earn money from sick, pe sick people. Besides, can they ever know how many days and weeks of hard work it took me to learn what I know? This is why I always like to try out new methods of treatments so that no one will be able to pinpoint exactly what I am doing. During one period of my life, I used to give an ounce of castor oil to every sick person who came my way. No one had any reaction or got diarrhea from it. On the contrary, everyone got some relief from the ailment they had brought to me. One lady who watched me do this to various people decided to be smart. She tried to do the same thing herself but none of her patients were ever responded. In fact, they invariably got worse. Then she came to me and demanded to know why this was happening. I asked her in response, who told you to do this? Then what did she say? Nothing. What is she going to say? Obviously, I said something other than the castor oil was doing the trick. Obviously, he echoed. In fact, it was something ethereal, something that used the castor oil as a medium through which to exert its effort. Castor oil is, in, is itself a wonderful medicine, but this ethereal thing could have used any medium. One day, my friend Faram was suffering from intestinal colic. To help him out, I picked up the first bottle I could reach on the shelf and gave him two pills from it. The pain disappeared. When I was out of Bombay a few weeks later, the pain recurred and Faram looked for the bottle to dose himself again. This time he looked at the label and discovered that it was a hormonal preparation meant for regulating his wife's menses. He flew into such a rage that he threw the bottle out of the window. He must have had... Some choice words for you when you got back. He always had choice words for me. But then I always fired him too. That is the way our friendship was. To be fired in Indian English is to be chewed out, dressed down or similarly raked over the coal. You know, Faram's wife suffered for years with excessive menstrual bleeding. She would bleed for 20 days out of the month. She tried everything but got no relief. Finally, she came to me one day and said, look, I have had enough. I just can't stand it anymore. I am going to go and get a 
hysterectomy. I told her, all you want to do is stop the flow, isn't it? Then why do you worry? Drink this water and, and handed her, I handed her a full glass. She drank it and her menses stopped from that day onwards. Whenever I look at a woman, I see Ma and I cannot bear to see Ma in pain. One day when I was at a friend's house, I heard moaning from the next room. I asked him what the problem was and he said, Oh, it's my sister. She has been in labor for the whole day and there has been no progress so far. I am not sure whether we will need to go do a caesarean or what. I told him, Give me a shiny metal tray, one of those German silver ones you are so fond of. I traced a yantra on it with my finger. He asked me what I thought I was doing because he could not see anything on the tray. I ignored him and went into the room where the girl was lying on the bed. I showed her the tray. She could not see the, see the yantra either. But within a matter of minutes, the child was born. That is the power of yantras. Now I understand why all these old friends of yours keep posturing you, keep pestering you to heal them or their family members. It is because they know your capabilities. Having learned a few of my capabilities, they are trying to capitalize on them for their own benefit. Some of them have even told me that I should start healing the sick en masse. But besides the fact that the fame from such programs would ruin my life, what about the Runanubandha? I have to have an appropriate Runanubandha with someone in order to heal them. Is that true of any doctor? Yes, and of any astrologer or any other professional. He wants to help someone out. But there are so many people with whom I have Runanubandhas that if I tried to heal all of them at once, I would run out of Shakti before very long. I am not Jesus and I have never claimed to a Bhagavan. Sometimes even my own karmas become too much to bear. And I have even had to use some funny business to cure myself. I don't like to do it because I believe that it's better to suffer now and be free of burden of your karmas rather than to hide from them. After all, they are sure to catch up with, your, with you anyway eventually but in a crisis you do whatever is necessary some years ago a doctor durandhara lived in bombay somehow or other he had lost his son and nearly went mad as a result afterwards he began to treat me like i was his son he was always coming and around to see how i was and to check on my health he would give me medicine whenever i needed it and sometimes even when i did not when I needed antibiotics, he would usually give me an injection of penicillin. But one day, when he was out of penicillin, he gave me streptomycin instead. I had never taken streptomycin before and once had a severe reaction to it. High fever rigors the works. I thought I was done for. I called some of my friends who all sat around me crying, thinking I was going to die. So did I. Faram was abusing me as was his wont. The days he did not abuse me, I would ask him, what, my child, I have heard none of your beautiful language today. Are you ill? That would start him often. In insulting my family members with the foulest words, I enjoyed it. It was his peculiar way of expressing his love for me. Just as Faram was abusing Dr. Durandhar left and right for giving me the injection, Dr. Durandhar unexpectedly arrived to check on his patient. I could not let him see me in his condition when he looked at me he saw his son and if he saw me near death now it would be a second big shock for him that might prove fatal so somehow the fever disappeared and i became perfectly normal again i complimented him on his treatment made him happy and showed him the door as soon as he left the fever returned and faram started to abuse me again then i lost my temper i told roshni to bring me her quilt it was a beautiful brown satin quilt which her father had brought her to her from Burma and she never lent it to anyone else. It was so precious to her that she slept with it each and every night. But as soon as she heard that I wanted it, she handed it over to me. I told her to cover me with it and after about five minutes, I threw the quilt on the floor. I was perfectly alright but the quilt was hot. All the fever had gone into it. There it lay literally shivering by itself on the ground. I told Faram, be careful now. Whoever uses this quilt next will get the fever. Then Faram abused everyone loudly and shouting out the Parsi equivalent of not in my house. 
had roshni throw it out the window and that was it that was all i was cured don't ask me how but if somehow you transferred your fever to the quilt where did your karmas go they must have somehow gone into the quilt too something like that i cried slightly thinking of whoever must have picked it up and then said to him so the moral to the story is never pick up anything from the street especially not in india he laughed chapter 7 repay completed